Good to have you with us. And you're very welcome for those of you here in person. Great, uh, great to have you. Um, Leanne and I have just come back from two weeks away. We asked the Lord to give us a week uh, heat wave, and he did. It wasn't any good of him. And Mayo has never looked so good. We were staying with the Airbnb in someone's sort of back garden, you know, they had one, and the guy who grew up in Mayo, from Mayo, you know, he's, he said, there's never been a week like this ever in Mayo, Steve. And I told him he was welcome. So there we go. So uh, nice to be back. Nice to see you. And nice to see some new faces. Uh, we missed the banquet last week, but saw some lovely pictures. And great to have a few people from the banquet here. You're so welcome. Uh, we love having new people with us. Right. Uh, we go to the next uh, PowerPoint there, Kieran. Uh, for those of you that are new, the service is roughly about an hour long. I uh, will have some songs. Um, the way the government does things at the moment, we're not uh, allowed to sing, but if you want to mumble, hum, or just sort of sing quietly under your face mask, you're very welcome to. Otherwise, just reflect. W- one thing I've been learning in this time through this, you know, when we're not being able to sing, is how to encounter God through actually what thousands of believers for hundreds of years have been doing, which is more contemplative prayer and contemplative worship, to reflect and to, and to ponder and to meditate and uh, it's a different way of engaging with God, but I'd encourage you to do that today. Um, Stephen, if you're online, is your handsome online host. Uh, he'll be answering any questions you have, and hopefully you guys online can follow along and have some fun uh, in the chat as well as we go through the different things. Uh, if you are here in person, then down the stairs is the ladies' toilets, up the stairs is the, is the men's toilets, just on the left as you go through those doors, and at the end of the service, we'll head out. We come in this way, but we'll head out uh, that way. Um, and there's a self-service crash downstairs or outside for anyone who comes with children. There's no den or treehouse today, but there's um, provision there for you. I think that is everything. Um, so, uh, without any more to do from me, over to you, Andrew, who's going to lead us. Great. All right, thanks, Steve. So, before we sing the first song there, I just want us to take a moment and just prepare our hearts by reflecting on the idea of an altar. So in the Old Testament, altars were often built to commemorate an encounter with God, which is what we'd like to do now. And also the likes of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob would have used it to signify an event between God and themselves at that moment. So to build an altar and worship God as a way to express their genuine desire to give themselves wholly to the Lord because of what God has done in them first. So what does that mean for us today? It means that we can approach the altar and encounter God because of the perfect work of Jesus Christ. And Jesus was the high priest who offered himself as the perfect sacrifice so that we, the imperfect and the broken people, can come and approach the altar to receive grace, strength, encouragement, healing. To just take a moment and reflect on these few verses that I've put on the screen there. These are words that come from Jesus. And as you read these verses, just prepare your heart to approach the altar. And I just pray that we will find comfort in him and his words today. Oh, come to 
empty altar the Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Maria, please pray with me. Oh, Father God, as we enter August 2021, oh Lord, we sit in your presence. These last 18 months have been unlike anything we could have ever imagined. We had no idea what was coming, oh Lord, but you did. You knew we'd all be here in this place right now. You know the journey each of us would go through this COVID season. You knew the sadnesses, the joys, the heartbreaks, the hopes, the uncertainties, the new life. You knew all of this for each one of us, and, O oh Lord, you walked with us through it all. We praise your name, O oh great Father, for this. While everything around us is unexpected, you are never changing. You are sovereign, you are king, and, Lord, you're tender, and you know and chase after, after us intimately. We enter this new month with anticipation. Will this be the time that things go back to normal? 
Will schools reopen? Will we be able to gather again? Will we be inside before winter hits? Oh, Father, you hear these questions, and we rest in that today. Lord, I pray that, that we would come to know you more through this, that we'd be driven to prayer, and that you would meet us there, that you'd open our eyes to your love for us, and that you'd remind us who you are and whose we are, and that we would trust in you with all that we have. Father God, you're our hope and our salvation. We thank you for what this means, and we rest in your peace. We love you. Amen. 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 Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Maria. Good. Welcome if you came in during our first song. It's nice to have you here. Um, we are going to do our icebreaker. Now, um, if any of you know my daughter, Annabelle, she's uh, full of great questions. And uh, she expects mum and dad to know the answer to every question. Um, and when dad doesn't know the answer to every question, you know, it gets past the mum, so quite a lot. But there was uh, a question this holiday that she kept coming back to, to mum and I, uh, to, to Leanne and I, and, uh, and then, you know, we've now got Leanne's mum staying, so the question was put to Nanny, and everyone that Annabelle meets at the moment asks this question. So I thought, you know, Annabelle, I'm going to take your question and put it to the church. Uh, so if you don't like the question, do not have a go at my daughter. <laughs> no, if you don't like the question, then it's Annabelle's. There. So this is a chance to get to know people next to you and say hello and answer and have a bit of fun. So the question is, if you could be any age for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? So just stay in that year forever, okay, for the rest of your life. What year would it be? Would it be when you were 10, when you were 20, when you are 30, when you are 5? What age would you like to be? And you just I just love that age. I'd like to stay there forever, so or for the rest of your life. So turn around, say hello to the people around you, and, uh, and then you can answer that question. Over to you. Okay. Well, now, online, we have a few answers here. We have uh, 21 from Pat. We have, uh, we have uh, 22 from Maeve. There we go. Stephen wants to be 29. And Owen, Owen is an optimist, so he says 120. Would you look at that? Uh, we had 22, 23. Uh, Vinny and I were around 21. Leanne was 22. Any other ages? 32. Good age, was it? Or is it? It is. <laughs> Very good. Well, uh, that's a bit of fun anyway. A uh, couple of news items. Ola's going to help you with one of them. Um, so we are welcome to the world. Two new members of the CCC <laughs> church family. We have Otis Craig Mullen, born on the 22nd of July. And we have Aoife Everly uh, Sykes. And the father is at the back there, Greg. Uh, born on the 23rd of July. And I know that Kelsey's online and maybe Craig and Lindsay are too. So... Mum and uh, uh, babies are all doing well, so that's, uh, that's great. Uh, but uh, congratulations to them, and wonderful to be increasing our tribe. Uh, ba <laughs> different, I love the names Otis and Aoife, they're great names. And from the looks of this picture, Otis has already got his eye on Aoife. I don't know what we say about that. Look at him. He's, and she's like, I ain't even had any of it, you know? So uh, there we go. Um, okay, there's no kids program today, but uh, there is a self-service crash, and there's an outside playground if you need. Um, what's next? Survey. So, please, 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 online people, people in the hall today who are part of the church, please can you complete this? This is the last week to fill it in. We've had 18 people complete it. At 18 people survey of a church for around 80 to 100 people is pretty useless. Right? So, please complete the survey this week. Why? Four reasons we want the survey. Number one, are we still being formed into the kind of church we hope to be? that seeks the good of Dublin, that's based on the values that we've had from the beginning around mission and discipleship and community, uh, where we're looking to reach out into the city evangelistically and with social uh, care. Yeah, that's number one. Are we becoming that kind of a church? And if not, you know, what's God saying and things like that? How are we doing after lockdown? You know, as a church collectively, how are we doing? Three, what's it like in this online service? How are we finding it, the hybrid, the in-person and I guess the fourth thing is linked to that is we're thinking of could, is, would the Lord be leading us into a second service at some point, end of this year or start of next year, maybe a morning service. And just where are we? Well, where, you know, who's with us and how are we getting on and what do people think and all that. We just would love some feedback. So an 18-person survey is not, uh, is not helpful. And so please help us by completing the survey, getting your city groups to complete the survey, 
and uh, just, you know, we're going to push you this week. We're going to be texting you and saying, please complete the survey. We don't know who, you know, it's a, it can be anonymous, but we'll just, you'll get messages from us. So please, 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 I think I've said that enough now. Complete the survey. Um, hola. Yeah. Um, and also, this Wednesday, uh, we have our monthly prayer and worship night. Um, and Steve actually mentioned in the beginning, uh, you know, the season without being able to sing out loud um, teaches us how, um, yeah, how to approach worship and how to um, just go into that time of reflection and contemplation. And the prayer and worship night is really a great time for that, whether you're joining online or in person, both options are available. And actually, I had a chance to come in person last month, and for me, it was such a blessing. Um, so um, I think this month I'll be joining online, but if you, if you are able and, and willing, then, then I do encourage you to come in person because it's, it's just an experience of being able to just leave all distractions and just be in that one hour with God, with our own thoughts, and uh, just a, an hour to stop and pray and listen. Um, and really encounter God together. So, um, yeah, whether online or in person, I encourage you to join in, and that's this Wednesday at 7.30, and in person will be in, this, um, in the hall, and please sign up online, and it's the usual uh, Zoom link as well through the website. Super, thanks, Ola. Uh, so, we are starting a new series today in the Psalms of Lament, and uh, being honest with God, and we're about thinking about praying our sadness or praying when we're depressed. So Jeremy's going to come and do the reading. It'll be on the screen. If you have a Bible or a phone that helps you, Psalm 13 is where, we're, where we are today. Hello, everyone. So the reading today is from Psalm 13. For the director of music, a psalm, a psalm of David. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Thanks, Jeremy. Let's take a moment uh, to, to be quiet and uh, just to pray. So just where you are, be quiet. Prepare your hearts to hear God speaking to you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your great wisdom and kindness to us in giving us the Psalms of Lament. You knew that walking in this world full of brokenness and sin and disease and heartache and death, that we need ways to process it, and you've given us these words. So teach us as a church, Lord, but more than teach us, meet with us, please, by your Spirit, that we might be, we might be changed and we might go deeper with you because we've learned how to lament and how to be honest with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, psalms of lament, what are they? Um, they are songs or they're prayers that God's people have used for thousands of years to process sadness, anger, and confusion. To lament is to grieve. To lament is to voice emotions in a moment of darkness. To lament is to protest, to say to God, this is not how life is supposed to be. The last 18 months have been very challenging for us all and society, we, you know, we're, we're sort of emerging, we're opening up again in some ways and we've all had our stories of loss. Frustration, heartache, setback, complex relationships, dynamics, our relational worlds shrunk. Our plans changed or were obliterated. Our normal physical contacts disappeared. It's been tough. For some, it's been brutal. 
I remember in the middle of one of the lockdowns, speaking to a lady that had already gone through a number of personal bereavements, multiple personal setbacks, a number of health issues and scares, and had lived in a very crowded house, homeschooling and trying to hold it all together. And she was at the end of herself. At the start of the summer, I chatted to a young man who was facing depression. He had started to see a counselor and described how he had no desire to get up in the mornings anymore. He'd always struggled with low self-esteem and purpose, but the last 18 months had pushed him deeper into those issues. And he said to me, for the first time, I'm having panic attacks, Steve. Or I remember my own heart at various times in the last 18 months, feeling helpless as I saw others and heard others struggle and suffer. No easy way to help, certainly no way to fix. It weighed me down. It, it, it made me despondent at points. It's been a tough 18 months. And, and it's actually interesting, not just what has happened to us as a community, the church community, global community, community in Dublin, however you want to phrase that. It is what is happening. As we emerge out of it and we sort of come out some, some other side of whatever we're coming into, we're not sure. And, and that's kind of the point. What are we emerging into? Life is still pretty strange. It can be confusing. We might have got to the other side, but we can be pretty bruised. We rejoice for the changes that are meaning life's a bit more open, but we can feel stagnant or numb or uncertain, and it's not easy. A word that's been used to describe the state of our world for many people right now is um, the word languishing. Languishing is the, 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 the place between depression and flourishing. It's the place between despair and thriving. Languishing is an empty state, an eating state. So where do we turn to process all that's happened and is happening? How can we emerge out of this desert experience? How can we move from languishing to thriving? Well, God in his wisdom and grace has given us a rich resource called the Psalms of Lament. I remember in that conversation with the lady that I had, who was coming to the end of herself, I asked her about her prayers. And I said, are you, are you still speaking to God about any of this? And she, you know, very honest, she said, no, I've stopped. She actually felt she's being punished by God and was scared of him. I asked her if she felt she could be angry at God. And she said, I'm not sure I'm allowed to be. And I encouraged her she was, that she was. And she did say she started talking honestly to him again. You see, what do you need when life is tough? A place to be real. A place to be real. A place to be honest. A place to be known. Assurance that it's safe to express what you're feeling in the presence of God. And you will not be corrected for bad theology or aggressive sentiment. Or, no, you can just be safe to express. You can be raw with God. The Psalms of Lament say it's safe. Here's what the Psalms of Lament do. They say, do you want a superficial relationship with God or do you want a deep one? Superficial relationship with God, it's all nice, we're Christians. The Psalms of Lament say, you get real with God and it's not always pleasant. It's a deep relationship, not a superficial one. I once heard someone say the Psalms of Lament are grooves, or the Psalms in general, are grooves that we can walk down. You know, they've been trod by other people for many years, and they provide a way to get out of that stagnation and, the, the, you know, the places we can be in where we can find that we're not able to move, and they get us moving again. When it comes to feelings, we're going to be thinking about a number of feelings in this Lament series. There's two dangers. You can ignore your feelings which makes you emotionally numb. You suppress what's going on, you put on a mask, you brush everything under the carpet, you tell everyone it's grand, you carry on as normal. All that's happening is you're slowly hardening your heart and becoming numb to actually how you feel. In fact, you're not sure how you feel anymore because you've suppressed your emotions for so long. We can become cynical, we can give up easily, and then we judge others for their enthusiasm and effort. If only they knew what I'd been through, and you get, that's, that's, that's the numbness. Or you can get ruled by your feelings, which means emotional chaos. You're not numb, but you're chaotic. Your emotions are up and down as your circumstances. Your inner life is chaotic as your external life. We may not be emotionally numb, but we're emotionally unstable. The Psalms of Lament help us avoid both extremes. They give us a groove, 
We don't have to ignore our feelings and be numb. We don't have to be ruled by our feelings and be chaotic. We don't have to sink into a pit of stagnation, but nor do we have to run at 100 miles an hour thinking the wheels might come off at any moment because life is so chaos, is so chaotic. In the Psalms of Lament, God says to his people, to you and me, it's safe. Come and be real. Take off the mask. How are you doing? And so we're going to look at five psalms, praying our sadness, praying our anger, praying when suffering, praying in exile, praying in despair. So today we're thinking about praying our sadness or praying when we're depressed. First question, am I allowed to be depressed as a Christian? It's a similar question to what my friend asked me, am I allowed to be angry at God? Does it make me less of a mature Christian to be depressed? Am I less connected to God if I'm depressed? You know, there's a stigma, isn't there, often, or a shame attached to admitting that you're depressed. It's a sign of weakness, a defeat. It's a sign that you can't do it on your own. And then if you're a Christian, you can sort of go, well, is it a sin? Is something wrong with me? Have I done something wrong? You know, good Christians don't get depressed, do they? The Psalms of Lament say, yes, they do regularly. Yes, they do. Some of God's best. Some of God's giants go through the toughest times with great melancholy, depression, sadness, doubt, confusion. It is not a sign that you're not a Christian or that you've sinned necessarily or that you're immature. People like David, today's psalm, Jeremiah, Job, and even God's son. Do you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he say? My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. There's a man expressing great depth and grief and wanting people to pray with him. How would a modern psychologist describe Jesus' state in Gethsemane depressed, pre-traumatic or post-traumatic stress disorder, grief of anxiety of the highest order, suicidal? And what did Jesus do when he had to face his hour of darkness. I say this every time we do the Psalms, but it's so important. How did the Son of God deal with the real challenges of life? He ran to the grooves that are the Psalms. On the cross, what does he cry out? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, a Psalm of Lament. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Psalm 31, a Psalm of Lament. I thirst, a real traumatic Psalm of Lament, 69. Jesus processed his darkness with these psalms. We are foolish if we think we can do life without them. Now, we have an advisory team at Christ City Church, older, battled, scarred uh, warriors who support us in prayer with advice. And one of them is a lecturer at the Irish Bible Institute called Joan Singleton. And she went through a time of severe depression after having her first child, and um, in, in one of the lockdowns, she did some training with a number of our leaders here at, at the church about how we can become a safe space to process uh, those that are having really tough times and, and, and be a community of support. And she spoke about symptoms of blackness, loss of hope, crying, appetite disturbance, sleep disturbance, overwhelming weariness, high, heightened sensitivity, worry, poor concentration, indecisiveness, guilt, and, and others. She spoke about apathy, loss of feeling and interest, anxiety, agitation, and panic. And she helped us with her story of her time in, of being depressed. And, uh, and Psalm 13 is going to help us think, how do we process when some of those symptoms come upon us? And we're going to learn four things briefly. When praying when depressed, praying your sadness, pray with honest questions, pray with clear petitions, Pray with unwavering trust. And, and we always remember, we pray with song. The psalm is a song. We'll come back to that to finish. So we start by praying with honest questions. Verse 1, how long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? David talks as if God's forgotten him. And, 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 and not just he's forgotten, like that, that means like you're, you're withholding some practical help. From me. I've got this problem, God, and you, can you not see? There's a housing issue. There's a financial issue. 
There's a relationship challenge. I've got this, Lord, have you forgotten me? And then it's not just a practical help, it's personal. You're hiding your face. I don't even know you anymore. I don't feel like you're a friend anymore, God. You feel so distant right now. God not only hasn't helped him, but God isn't there, David says. Then verse 2. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? And day after day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? I can think of five or ten people that I'm regularly in contact with who would say that they regularly wrestle with their thoughts and have sorrow in their hearts. And God is often the problem because he's not solving it for them. God has allowed something or not done something and their friendship with God is in jeopardy. The Psalms tell us if you have a problem in life and with God, tell him. Really? I can be that raw like this? Asking questions with that force? Yes. And here's why. Here's why. It's worse if you don't tell him. It's worse if you don't tell him. Isn't that the case in any relationship? If, if Leanne and I have had a fight or if I'm angry or there's been confusion or whatever it is, if, if there's a hurt, for the relationship to survive, someone has got to start talking about it. Otherwise, a rift is built, a, wall, a rift is created, a wall is built up, and the relationship starts to deteriorate. If you're not talking to God when it's tough, with raw honesty, it's a lot worse than just ignoring him, isn't it? You see, the key thing with David when he's depressed is that he just keeps on praying. Job does the same. If you've read the book of Job, it's all these chapters of Job and his friends going, well, the point is, at least he's trying to process and pray his anger and his doubts and his confusion. So when you're depressed, when you're down in the dumps, keep talking, keep talking to God. Bring out those questions, those hurts, the confusion. Allow the Holy Spirit to go, God has heard that question and it was safe to ask it, even with that red hot anger that you asked it with. He's not offended he can't force himself on you. So if you're building up a wall, you've got to take the initiative to say, Lord, I've got a problem here and start to talk about it. And by the way, for us as a community, as we emerge from this period, we've got to ensure that the Christ City Church is a safe space to ask some questions that when people, to not expect something to be fixed overnight, to not get frustrated if people don't make progress when they, when they are sort of having a tough time. And not to correct people theologically when they're just expressing things. To be with them. It, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't offend God and if it doesn't scare God, it shouldn't offend or scare us when people need time and space to lament and process. God is big enough for it, so he wants us to be. So pray with honest questions when you're depressed and processing sadness. Secondly, pray with clear petitions, verses three to four. What's causing David's low ebb and his melancholy? Well, the first one seems to be sickness, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. David is facing some kind of form of sickness and wonders if he's gonna die. And then he talks about enemies. Enemies are always present in David's life. Someone wants to put him down. Someone wants to suffocate him. Someone wants to oppress him. Someone wants to gloat over him. Do you see how it's circumstances that trigger his depression? A sickness and an enemy. Joan from the advisory team, when she shared her paper afterwards about her depression, she talks about how a number of things conspired in her life to thrust her into compression, the depression. The birth of a child, an un, a new unknown environment living in London. She'd moved from Ireland to, to London for that time. Traveling on the underground every day in London. The loss of a job and her role that she had here in Ireland. A new church. Adjusting to being married. I mean, you know, having a kid and being married in a new city, you think, oh, this is going to be great. And she found it really tough. Always new, always different. It was a lot to process. And, and how many of you feel depressed when you are sick? or when you know that there's conflict. I mean, if there's anything to drain you, it's a conflict in a relationship and it's physical sickness, isn't it? And if, if you don't know how to then to process this lowness that is a very normal lowness as part of life, 
we're going to stagnate. So David comes to God with some really clear questions. He says, help me overcome my sickness. Look upon me and give light to my eyes. And secondly, help me overcome my enemy. Let them not rule over me, dominate me, suffocate me anymore. Let them not gloat over me. And you can sense the urgency, can't you? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. He's not being timid with the Lord. He's bold, he's clear, he wants an answer. God, what are you going to do with my, my petition? He's going after God. Repeatedly in scripture, we see that the great heroes of faith, when we listen to their prayers during times of trial, we notice two things. We notice one, they are very, very bold before God. And two, they are very, very specific. And they, they actually argue with real logic about the honor of God's name and the promises that God has said and how they are his children, all those kind of things. So there's this balance of passion and reasoning, urgency and logic. I want you to do this for me, God. This is why I want you to do it. Here is my case, my arguments, my reasons. Now over to you, would you go and do it? And it's as if God then has to answer. These pleas are far from tame and polite expressions of desire. They are serious and persuasive. Many writers have taught this wrestling with God, taking God at his word and with his promises and pushing them back on God. The Psalms of Lament do that. Sometimes your reasoning wins out and God answers your situation as you expect. Sometimes your reasoning is shown to be wrong and God answers by changing you. But you'll get an answer, even if it's not the one you wanted. So when you're depressed, Psalm 13, when you're feeling really sad, you've got melancholy, a low ebb, you've just woken up in a bad place, I did this morning, pray with honest questions. Pray with clear petitions and finally pray with unwavering trust. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he's been good to me. Do you see the difference between one and two? Verses 1 and 2 and 5 and 6. God's hidden face has become unfailing love. Heart sorrow has become heart joy. The rampant foe and the physical illness have become arenas for God to show that he is good. For you have been good to me. What we see in the pattern of Psalm 13 is actually a pattern we see within the whole of the book of Psalms. 1 to 150. It's a, it's, 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 it's a pattern that we see. There's a few that are exceptions, but on the whole, this is how the pattern goes. From depression to singing. From trouble to deliverance. From exile to homecoming. From desolation from, to delight. From fear to faith. To bitterness to, from bitterness to love. From despair to hope. From loneliness to community. From darkness to light. From vulnerabilities to, to stability. From apathy uh, into action. My clicking is not as good as my speaking. <laughs> uh, you get the pattern. Do you see it in Psalm 13? Depression and anguish, verses 1 and 2. Prayer and wrestling with God, verses 3 and 4. Assurance and joy, verses 5 and 6. Do you see the groove that God has given you in his wisdom and kindness? No matter where you are, it can take you from that place so you don't stagnate, you don't go numb, you don't have an emotional meltdown and chaotic experience. You're given a groove. It doesn't happen overnight. But you have a place to find God in prayer and through finding him you find you have all you need. Because listen, notice how David writes in the past tense. For he has. What? Past? What about the enemy? What about the sickness? Do you think that's been answered by verse 6? We only heard about it in verses 3 and 4. Time hasn't passed, David. What are you on about? He doesn't know if he's going to overcome his sickness or if his enemy is going to be defeated. But he's 100% sure that God will be good to him. That is the power of prayer. His, circumstance, his circumstances have not changed by the time David has finished, but his perspective on his circumstances have changed. His desires have changed. His confidence in God has changed. His emotional state has changed. He is now singing. Has that ever happened to you? 
You go to God in a state of rage and depression and anguish and uncertainty. You wrestle with him in prayer. You get other believers to pray for you. And whilst none of your external circumstances may have changed, your heart changes. And you suddenly, you sense by the Holy Spirit an assurance that the Lord will be good to you. And you're able to leave all those questions and all that emotion and all those petitions and they were all important and they were all heard but you're able to leave them with him and in, inside the spirit says the lord has been good to you and you go yeah and you're changed this morning i just had two weeks magnificent holiday woke up i started thinking about our work and hubspot that starts on tuesday thinking about my sermon today just thinking about what well, just woke up in a low place you know what did I do? Got out the Psalms. A few Psalms on from this. Psalm 27. There's a beautiful Psalm here. Psalm 27. And the Psalm talks about this. There's one thing I ask of the Lord. This is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to see him in his temple. In other words, God, if I just get a glimpse of you, it'll, my heart will be at peace. And it was. But the Psalm then goes on after having this place of peace and he starts talking about, God, you're hiding your face and there's false witnesses and the commentary I'd written, I was telling Marco and Andrew, says, isn't the psalm fascinating, Psalm 27? Because you have this moment, amazing moment of clarity as the psalmist says, I'm in the presence of God, it's amazing. And the next minute he's going, oh Lord, it's all in anguish. And, and, and the little commentary that I'd written in my Bible says, the changing moods of the soul, the ebb and flow of faith, altering from prayer and praise. In other words, this is life of the Christian. You wake up sometimes and you just feel like you're down in the dumps. And there's nothing wrong with you, but you do need to find the groove. Otherwise, you'll stay there. It's like an aeroplane taking off sometimes. You wake up in the morning, it's a bumpy takeoff, isn't it? <laughs> and then you get out of the clouds and you see that's the power of the sounds of lament. You wrestle through the cloud and the storm and the choppiness and, the, and what's going on. And, <clears throat> and you come to a place of peace as you see what God sees. I just read a fantastic book that I commend to you called Dirty Glory on Holiday um, by Pete Craig, all about the 24-7 prayer movement. And he had this, I just thought it was so appropriate for today's sermon. He says this at one point, comment on his own life. It's a common human tendency to settle in our grief, to redefine the geography of our lives according to the contours of our pain. And of course, when we are bereaved and hurting, it's important to stop for a while and to lament our loss. It's not healthy to continue as if nothing is wrong. But neither is it healthy to make disappointment our permanent domain. You've got to be real with God. You've got to take time to process, but you mustn't make disappointment your permanent domain. The Lord has been good to us. And so we finished by thinking about we pray with honest questions, with clear petitions, with unwavering trust, and then finally with song. The psalm says, Psalm 13, for who the director of music? These are songs. Songs have a power to touch our hearts and process trauma and loss. Music and song are great and mysterious gifts to touch broken hearts that are beyond just rational explanation. Sometimes we cannot think it all out. You know, someone like me, I want to think it all out, and I can't, but somehow I can sing it all out. It softens us. Music softens us. Music draws us to God. It draws us even back to ourselves to feel again sometimes or to control those feelings and channel them. Even as we listen to music or on our own as we sing, so we're going to do that shortly. And as David sings, do you see that line? I, I brushed over it. My heart rejoices in your salvation. The salvation we have is far greater than the salvation David had. One day, another king from the line of David would come and he'd pray this psalm, wouldn't he? He'd live a life of love and kindness, compassion, justice, righteousness, and mercy. But he'd be killed for that. And he'd be mocked by his enemies. This king, like verse 1 says, would feel forgotten by God. 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He would lose God's face in his hour of darkness. He would wrestle with his thoughts in Gethsemane and say his soul was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He would know what it is to have his enemies mock him and spit at him and, and, and you know, sing with triumph thinking they'd won. And he would sleep in death. Because he die our death under, of sin, under judgment of God. And why? So we could rejoice in a salvation that can never be taken from us. So we could know no matter how dark our darkness, there's always light. No matter how depressed we can get, it's not, depression is not going to have the last word. It doesn't have to be our permanent domain to reassure us that no, how, no, how, no matter how confusing it gets, his love never fails. So we can say, as with Psalm 13, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. We're going to end our time. We've got 10 minutes. I'm going to invite Andrew back. He's going to come and lead us in some songs. And we're going to allow time just to process and be honest with God. Allow the music to touch our hearts. Allow hopefully Psalm 13 and the words I've shared to touch your mind. And allow God to take you on a bit of a journey, a bit of a groove from where you are to where he wants you to be. So I'm going to ask you as we start, and Andrew's going to start playing, just to think of what are some of the losses, some of the traumas, some of the confusing things some of the things that have unsettled you, whatever it is, the hurts, the pains, just to have those in your mind. And, uh, and then we're going to sing and pray, and I'm going to just lead us a few times through it. So I want you to start by just thinking. Close your eyes if, if you feel able and comfortable. Just to think of something that you know is wedged deep down that maybe it is a bit of a wall between you and God. Some hurt some loss maybe a word someone said or an experience you had or something that's not coming to fruition that you want to and I want you to, to take that and just allow yourself to feel be aware of how you do feel. And as you process, just ask God a question. Be honest with him. that God is absent? Is it that you've had this for years? Is it something from the last week? Is it even something just from today? What, do you, what question do you have for God? It's a safe place to ask that question. And then I want you to think, what do you want from God? What is your request in this situation? If you're anything like me, you can often have a problem, but you actually don't even know what you quite want. What specifically do you want God to do or to be or to happen? And then with that question and that petition, I want you just to think of something about what Christ has done in this salvation. That means you can still trust him. You may not have an answer yet, but something that means I can still trust you. With all that in your mind, I'm going to pray and then we're going to listen to Andrew sing and just process that with song and allow the song to penetrate our hearts. So Father, we, we come to you, Lord. You know all of our hearts. You know our great 
the dark parts of our hearts, our sin and the ugliness and the things we do wrong and, you know, the, the places which are just full of sadness and sorrow and loss and disappointment. And you know the places, Lord, where we don't even know what, what's going on in our hearts. We don't know what we, what we do feel or how we do process that. You know us all, Lord, and we thank you that with you it's safe. It's safe to be honest. It's safe to be real. And I pray, Lord, you'd help us as a church to allow you into our pains and our hurts and our sadnesses and our losses and our confusion. That we'd learn to have this level of intimacy and rawness and depth with you that we see David has to ask questions of you, to push your promises back on you, to take you at your word and say, well, do it, Lord. And I pray, Lord, we'd continue to circle back with this trust, rejoicing in the great salvation we have in Jesus. So I pray, Holy Spirit, minister to our hearts today, this week, and in these next few moments, and through this series in the Psalms of Lament. In Jesus' name. Amen.
God. Just, uh, just gonna, to finish the service, I'm going to invite you to stand. And Andrew's just going to sing a little refrain over us as a way of blessing us and asking God just to remind us of these wonderful truths. It's just a little chorus. He'll sing it a few times and then I'll pray to finish. Darkest night you can light it up you can light it up a god of revival let hope arise death is overcome you already won a god of revival darkest night darkest night Father, as we uh, stand here in your presence, we're so grateful that you can light up the darkest night. You are a God of revival. Thank you for the great stories in scripture where you separated the sea so that your people could walk through. And Lord, you know every story in this room, you know every heart where people are asking for deliverance, to be set free from fear, to overcome earthly obstacles. But most of all, Lord, you know that our greatest need is to know you and to have your face shine upon us to know the blessing and the peace that comes from of encountering you through prayer and worship and scripture and being together. So we thank you for this time and we thank you for the great salvation that we can rejoice in. That neither height nor depth, neither the present nor the future, neither angels nor demons, nothing can ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. We thank you for that. In his name we pray. Amen. Guys, thanks for coming. That's the end of our time. Uh, there'll be just some music playing in the background if you want to stay and reflect for a little bit longer on your own. Otherwise, do, do head out. And uh, we'll see you hopefully uh, on Wednesday for, for prayer and worship night at uh, 7.30. So God bless you all.